God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, we set our affections on you tonight, God. Thank you, Lord. God, because we've tasted of your goodness, when we come and we get anything less, we can tell, we can feel it, God. We're addicted to where we need you. We know, God, that when there is a moment that we're without you, it can't be normal, it can't be okay, God. We need your presence. So, God, we just ask for your fullness tonight. We're small in number, but, God, we ask for your fullness because you know that you offer it to us. We come in boldly to your throne room, God, and we give you praise. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. was addicted Since the day you touched me I was addicted
Right now in this anointing, as we're singing about praise, I want to pray for Pastor and Sister Kim. I talked to Pastor right before service, and both of them are having symptoms of sickness in their body. And you know, a lot of times when we hear about somebody that's experiencing those things, rather than getting into faith, we get into sympathy. That we feel sorry for, and that's compassion, that we suffer along with them. We don't want our pastors, both of them, to be sick and we declare that healing even now but rather getting over into a place of sympathy how many of you know praise is a weapon amen don't you remember real battles with real swords and real armies rather than sending a volley of arrows out rather than slinging some rocks or some catapults the weapon that God gave the children of Israel was the weapon of praise even the impregnable walls of Jericho came down with a shout of praise. And we don't even have to ask for pastor's healing again because we already asked for that. What we do as faith people, we praise right in the midst of it. Let's do that now. Hallelujah, Lord. Your praise will ever be on our lips. We praise you that you heal. We praise you that you heal somebody but we praise you that you heal here. Not just in Africa, not just in South America, not just in another town or another church, but right here, right now, tonight, we receive healing for Pastor Brian. We receive healing for Sister Kim. Lord, we thank you for that praise. We let that praise be ever on our lips, even now. We praise you, Lord. We lift up a shout of praise. Worthy is our God, for He is good. His love, His mercy, His anointing, His healing power endures forever. And it is enduring in their lives right now. In Jesus' name.
there's a fresh feeling that's available to us right now specific for physical weariness the Lord was just ministering that to me over there the fresh feeling for the remedy for physical weariness it's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that quickens our mortal bodies this, this part of this song, the most powerful part, that I'm finally coming to the end of myself, I need you. It's, it's not begging. It's releasing ourselves out of our own strength and over into a total dependence on the power of God. That's what's available to, for now, for right now. If that's you, if that's physical weariness, if that's what you're fighting and combating, whether it's something from the block party, whether it's something long term, don't receive it. Take it right now.
dominating issues, alcohol and drugs, and we, we had talked about how we might run into people when we see them, they're drunk, or when we see them, they're high. Maybe not in an official counseling appointment in an office someplace, but maybe even at the block party. And at the end of class, Charlie raised his hand and he said, how do you counsel somebody that's drunk? He says, I never had experience in that. And I said, me neither. <laughs> and we talked about it and we I told what I knew. And on the way home, Kristen and I were talking about it. And the Lord ministered to me and says, you have dealt with that before. There's been times at the nursing home where I'll go around and I'll, I'll get the people that, you know, I'll go up and, and bring the people down. And there's people hanging out in the little nurses area and there'll be four or five wheelchairs and I'll talk to four of them and, and bring them down and that fifth one looks like they're out of it looks like that they're on medication or their mind's gone or something but I'll still ask them anyway do you want to go to church and they kind of look at me and if they don't say yes I just assume that means yes and I take them down to, uh, to church and time and time and time again I see them go from this comatose state to this state of, of total bliss in the Word of God, total bliss in the presence of God, where there's a total transformation that can take place. And what God told me, he said, that's the same thing that would happen that we're talking to a, to a person that's inebriated, high, and something like that. But you know, it's the same thing that can happen with physical weariness, that we can come in and we're dog tired. And we don't feel like coming to church. And pastor's not here anyway. We wish we would have known so we could have stayed home. <laughs> but you come in here and you get in the presence of God. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead quickens you where, where now you feel like you could go someplace. Get some sleep tonight. Don't stay up all night. But that redeeming of the physical weariness. Not because you got caught up on physical sleep, but because we got that fresh fill. That's what the power of the living God does. It doesn't matter if it's alcohol. It doesn't matter if it's mind problems. It doesn't matter if you, matter if you need a nap. It has been made available to us. Can we sing that one more time? What you were just singing? Lord God, we thank you. God, we thank you that we don't want to be in control. We want to be submitted. We don't want to be in control of what you're doing in our lives. We want you to be in control. 
of what we're doing in our life. We yield ourselves over to you, God. Your wisdom is made manifest to us. Your power is made manifest to us. Your spirit is revealed to us. Holy Spirit, thank you for being so faithful. Thank you for inhabiting the praises of your people. There was a shift when we lit off in praise. God, when you say that you inhabit the praises of your people, you do it every time. You're an every time God. And we thank you for it. We trust you all the time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just in this anointing, let's be seated, but you're already seated for the most part. <laughs> um, as we mentioned during praise and worship, Pastor and Sister Kim are home. We're believing that even as the presence of God was filling this place, that the presence of God was, I don't know if they're watching via uh, live via satellite or not, but the presence of God that's here can go right over there and displace whatever that problem is, just as it displaced physical weariness here, it's displacing physical ailments there, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Um, I, I don't want to be too long tonight. I want to talk a little bit about the offering, and then what I want to do is just open up the last amount of time that we have in the service for testimonies specific to the block party. We're such a busy church, and it was such a powerful weekend last weekend. I don't want to just go on to the next thing. That we, we had the block party that was great, then we went on to guest speaker, now we're on to whatever it is we're doing next. I believe that this past weekend there were some monuments that we need to set up. Ever since I've been coming to this church, Pastor Brian's been talking about, I've got a real heart for Tarpon Springs. I've got a real burden for Tarpon Springs. I want to start a Bible study over in Tarpon Springs. I want to send somebody out to Tarpon Springs. Guys, we went and took new ground in Tarpon Springs, Florida on Saturday. And more so than that, I think Faith, Family of Faith Church is partnering up. I don't know. I don't have any specifics about it. I don't know if Pastor or Brother Wayne or something talking talking about it, but there, if there's ever been a church that really got to see what the block party is all about, not just being a participant, but being a partner moving forward. Amen. So uh, just for a, a quick offering teach, I want to teach a little bit and then testify about something God did for me specific to the offering, and then we'll receive the offering, and we're going to open it up for testimony. So turn over with me to Isaiah chapter 51. I, the book of Isaiah chapter 51. Two Wednesday nights ago, uh, I had the privilege of being uh, able to teach on that Wednesday night. Was anybody here that night? If if you weren't, I strongly encourage you to get the to get the CD, to, to order the CD of that message. Some things came out. I'm not saying it because I had the privilege of teaching it. I learned a whole bunch of things leading up to and coming up to. Yes, ma'am. Two two weeks ago, two Wednesday nights ago. Yes, it was. You can see my head prints all over this part of the ceiling right here. Um, and I just want to talk about, as we get ready to receive the offering, just a little, uh, a, a, a little testimony, a big testimony, but a little version of it. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 1, it says, Hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn, into the hole of the pit whence you're dug. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. In verse 1 here it says, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, and you who seek the Lord. Who's that talking to? That's talking to me. It's talking to the church, but I make that personal. Somebody says I'm hearing off after righteousness. I'm seeking after the things of God. I raise my hand. That's me. Anybody else? Yeah. Amen. One or two people. Very good. We have some Christians here tonight. Come on, church. When they when they call you stupid, do you turn around? Please say no. If they call you stupid, don't turn around. If they call you poor person, don't turn around. If they call you sick person, don't turn around. If they call you cursed person, definitely don't turn around. 
But when they say, hey, you that follow after righteousness, I'm turning around and saying, yes. They, they turn around and say, you that seek after the Lord. What What'd you say? I know you got to be talking to me. Hey, blessed man. Hey, man of God. Hey, woman of God. They got to be talking to me. What it's saying, he says, listen to me. You that follow after righteousness, say that's me. And you that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence you're hewn, into the hole in the pit whence you're dug. Talking about holes and talking about pits. Doesn't sound very good, does it? But it is. This isn't talking about the pit of hell. This isn't talking about whatever hole you crawled, crawled out of. What this is talking about, these phrases, the rock that you've been hewn out of, the hole in the pit that you came out of, these phrases have to do with mining. These are mining terms, like rock or precious stones that have been uh, mined from the same shaft. Of course, if we're talking about people following after righteousness, people that seek the Lord, another phrase of that is vessels of honor. Anybody remember what the vessels of honor in the Bible are made out of? Gold, silver, precious metals. What this is talking about is those precious metals that come from the same vein in the rock. Let me say it to you a different, little bit different way. Uh, several months ago, I was in Home Depot. And I was looking at some tile for Abigail's bathroom. And I came across a couple of different styles of this marble tile that I really, really like. And uh, one of them was like a mocha color, like the color of a cup of coffee with cream in it, mocha. And this other one was kind of a cream shade with some hints of gray in it. And I'm looking at these, and I thought both of them might look good and Abigail's bathroom, and I wanted to find out how much they were. So I look, and the mocha-colored one, I see this great big palette on the floor right in front of me and the price tag right there. That cream and gray one, I'm looking for, and I'm not seeing a price tag for it. I'm not seeing a box for it. I'm looking up above. I'm looking in the racks next to me. I'm turning around. I'm going to the other aisle. I'm doing everything I can do to find out what, you know, what style this is and how much it costs. I couldn't find it. Finally, one of the Home Depot employees come by and said, excuse me, could you help me? And I told him, I'm, I found this tile, but what about this other tile, this light colored one? He goes, oh, that's the same tile. I said, what? How can that be the same tile? These weren't a couple of shades off. These were two different colors. And I said, how could that be that these two different tiles could be in the same box? And he says, well, they're all the same color. They were probably taken from different parts of the rock, different quarries, this and that. You with me so far? You got two of the same tile, but they are vastly different because they come from different places, different rock quarries. Kristen and I went to another place right over here and looked at some, some tile. And they had, not the mocha, but they had cappuccino tile. So we're looking at this cappuccino, and it, this place had some nice displays set up, like a, like a sale, uh, uh, model bathrooms set up. And I'm looking at this model bathroom, and every single one of those tiles matched up, you know, as far as the color, almost exactly. And the sales guy comes over and talks to us, and I said, excuse me. I notice all these tiles match up. Are they like that in the box? And I told him about the experience that I had at Home Depot, and he replied, he goes, oh, no. Those ones that you saw over there, those are second and third quality. These uh, tiles, they're all the same color because they are hewn from the same place. And he told whatever place they get their marble from. Of course, he's real proud of this thing. You got one set of tile that comes from all kinds of different places. And it's all different colors. You got another one that all comes from the same place and it's all the same color. In here, what we're talking about, you that seek after the Lord, you that follow after righteousness, you're not hewn from a bunch of different rocks. You're hewn from the rock and the hole in the pit whence you're dug. Not coming from all kinds of different places. It's coming from one place. Then in verse 2, we find out what that place is. Look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. It's saying, 
we that seek after the Lord, we're cut from the same cloth as Abraham. We're a chip off the old block. Hallelujah. Remember, this is for the offering here. Now, keep in mind, God called Abraham and said that he called him alone. He called him when it was just good old Abram of Ur of the Chaldees, somebody's neighbor, somebody's son, nobody's father. Abraham, Abram was just, you know, he couldn't have kids, was stuck in that situation. But he got in faith, and God completely transformed his life. He blessed him. He increased him. Now, the Bible tells us, we won't take the time to turn there, but the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3 that if you are Christ's, the rock, then you are also Abraham's seed. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that Abraham is the father of all them that believe. Any believers in here tonight? Amen. Every hand better go up at Rock Church of Tampa Bay. <laughs> we are believers. Because we are believers, Abraham is the father of faith. He is the father of us all, according to the scriptures. That is the rock that we're cut from. And in that message that we taught a couple weeks ago, we were following this scripture. We were looking unto the rock whence we were hewn, Abraham. And the Bible talks about following after the same steps of faith that he followed after. Now, here's the part where I want to get to the testimony. I'll tell you the punchline first. I got a 20% raise last Monday, retroactive back to the first of the year. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All glory. All glory belongs to the Lord. Now, God had told me to do this certain thing. This Remember we were talking about tests and heart tests is in that message from a couple weeks ago. God told me to do this certain thing. Unfortunately, I didn't immediately receive it as the word of the Lord for action that I'm supposed to take. I received it as a thought that I should pray about way later <laughs> and didn't act on it right away. And a couple of times over the next few weeks, this thought, came up and I should have known it was the Holy Spirit but I was lax and slack so finally that Monday before that would have been you know two weeks ago Wednesday two days before that I had just started seriously studying for that message at that point I didn't even realize I was going to be preaching it on that Wednesday night but I started studying that morning seriously just really getting into the word with respect to that message and I was on my way to work and just hashing over some things in my mind about that, that message. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me extremely strongly. He said, how are you getting ready to preach a message on passing tests and your heart being after me? And you're not going to do that thing I asked you to do. Woo! Yeah. And I got right real quick. And I realized that that wasn't me just thinking about it. That was something that the Lord wanted us to do. My first thought was to be able to call Kristen. And uh, uh, it was right at the point where I know I'm not supposed to call because she's just getting in the car, just getting the kids ready and all that stuff. And I've called at that time, and it, it's usually not the best time to call. <laughs> and especially when I'm getting ready to drop this thing on her because this faith step that God wanted us to do, it wasn't flip a quarter into the offering or fast for five minutes. It was something significant for us. And, and to just to be real with you, like I know everybody's gone through this, initially when God told me to do this, I got to thinking about how much it was going to cost me rather than the blessing the Lord and blessing somebody else in this. So, so I didn't call Kristen right away and I said, God, at the same time, just confirm this on the inside. And when I say confirm, I don't mean fleecing God or asking for a you know, star, shooting star across the sky or anything like that. I just wanted him to confirm it so it was settled into my heart. And then later on that morning, God did it exceeding abundantly above all I could ask or think where I knew that I knew that I knew that this was the thing that we were supposed to do. So I called Kristen and told her. Now, keep in mind, I had had three weeks to hash over this thing and to argue with God and ignore God and all the things I did. 
Me telling Kristen she had three minutes or three seconds as I blurt this thing out that we're getting ready to do. And her reaction wasn't all that good. And I don't fault her for that at all because my initial reaction wasn't all that good. And I learned something that day. And this is something that's that's specific to husbands and wives. It's something specific for those of you that teach in this place that so many times we want to get to the good part. Like if we're teaching a message, we want to get to the revelation. We want to get to the juicy part, something like that. But people aren't following you where you're going. you got to lay some groundwork to get everybody pointed in the right direction so they're able to be where you're at by the end of that message. And it's the same thing with with ministry teams, with work teams, that you can come out and blurt something out and say, no, we're going in this direction now. And they're going, what? How, how did this happen? So I had the opportunity to, to go back to the beginning and and explain this, where it all came from, because getting ready to do, we, we were doing something financially. And um, uh, you got to be in agreement for that. Husbands and wives, you got to be in agreement for that. Don't, don't sow a seed when you guys are in strike. You just threw it away if you did something like that. So it was extremely important to me to be able to do that. So, okay, so now we're in line with the Word of God. Remember at the end of that message, for those of you that were here, I said a phrase that God laid on my heart, whatever God tells you to do, do it. And I couldn't wait for the service to be over. I couldn't wait for the altar time to be over because I was going, we were going to do what it is that God told us to do. And we did it. And we weren't sorrowful about it. And we didn't think about how much it cost us. We were glad to be a blessing. We were blessed to turn around and be a blessing. Five days later, my boss calls me into the office. Now, usually at the company that I'm with, it's a you you get a standard 10% raise. That if you get a if you get a promotion, you get 10% with an in-place promotion like that. And that would have been good, and I'd still be up here telling the same testimony, and I'd still be just as excited for a 10% raise. But when I saw that number slid across the table at me, and I saw the effective date on that number, woo! <laughs> I, I didn't even tell Kristen. I just took a picture of it and texted it to her. <laughs> but here's the thing about it, and this is the, the thing I want to tell that, that right as we get ready to receive the offer, our company is not doing bonuses this year. Usually we get a big bonus, right? This week, at the end of February, beginning of March, we usually get a 7 to 10% bonus that we didn't meet financial numbers this year, so we weren't getting. God still gave me the bonus and made the company pay. That's the best part about it. We was way later on that afternoon <laughs> that we were on the phone with Kristen and we were talking about something else, and I interrupted her, and I said, Krista, we still get the bonus, and Cineverse had to pay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Whatever. I, I encourage you, not like again, not because I taught it, because some things came out there on the right way to pass tests. These aren't things that I've been living by for the last hundred years. I learned them as I was studying for that message and coming into those things. But I guarantee you I'm going to be doing tests like that nowadays and transform the way that I've thought and transform the way that we've done things to be able to pass these tests and be able to go to the next level. Amen. So let's stand together. Let's get ready to receive the offering and we'll have 30 minutes for testimony. Lord God, we thank you for faith. We thank you for seed time and harvest. And as we get ready to sow our faith as a seed, we put money seed with that seed. We put faith with the money and money with the faith and we sow into the kingdom of God into good ground that people may be trained, that people may be equipped, that people may be saved, that lives may be transformed, uh, Lord, according as you give increase to that and then multiply this seed back to us 30, 60, and 100 fold. And we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The last two, as people are bringing their offerings, the last two 
block parties that we've had, I've noticed a big difference in one sp in multiple areas, but this area specifically. People are hanging around. In previous block party, even as George testified at the block on Saturday, he came to get his food, to get his free stuff, and to go home and, and get high again. <laughs> These last couple block parties, people came and stayed. There was one family that I, I was drawn to that George was, was drawn to. And we worked on this family the whole day. And at the end of the day, after the block party, the guy, the man, gave his heart to the Lord that day. If it would have been just them coming and going, they would have totally missed out on their hearts being saved. What I attribute this to is the extra prayer that's been going on. The, at, for this block party, we had Thursday morning prayer. The young adults hosted, and but it wasn't limited to just young adults. Thursday morning prayer for the two Thursdays leading up to the block party. At the last Largo block party, every time I saw, you know, Marie and Donnell, the mom and daughter that go to Pastor Dave's church, every time I saw them, they said, we went to the block and we prayed, and we went to the block and we prayed, and I thought about the rock that we've been hewn from, Abraham. What did Abraham do? He went and sojourned in the land. He went and walked around and saw that inheritance that he was going to get. That's what Marie and Rock Church of Largo was doing, sojourning in that land. And we did some sojourning. I, think, I especially want to thank Brian and Tammy and Nathan, and especially Brian for, for coming out and helping with the flyers and the sojourning that we did. But I really see the, the change in there is, is specific and attributed to the extra prayer that's going on. Um, who's up for different testimony? Are you telling our story, Catherine? <laughs> I want to. <laughs> I want to say a little more about to follow up on what Tim was saying about nursing homes. Uh, on Thursdays, I go to Evergreen Nursing Home and do a Bible study. And on Fridays, I go to Curlew Care and do a Bible study. And I preach every second Sunday at West Bay. Here's what I've found. Those, like Tim said, that they sit there and you think there's nothing there anymore. Their minds are gone. But when we start singing, these people that you've never even heard say a word will sing with you. These people that you could have sworn they were asleep or still sitting in the same position with their eyes closed, but they're singing or they're at least moving their lips. We need to never underestimate the power of praise and worship. Mm -hmm. Do I have to stand up? Okay, I've, hold on. <laughs> hold on, let me send a quick text. I was just going to uh, show you guys Tim's, uh, just kidding. <laughs> um, I wanted to play, hold on one second, I'm sorry. Yeah, I recorded all the, um, hold on, something happened to my phone, it just freezed up. Anybody want to share a quick testimony real quick? Nobody? You know, I have to say, honestly, out of all the block parties, this one was the bomb. It really was. These people, out of this world, thank you, God. They really, really hung out, and they enjoyed themselves, and it was just so nice. They cared. They listened to the music. They talked. It was so different, and I loved it. I mean, it was nice. It really was nice. I hope everybody else felt it, because I sure did. 
Um, I did want to talk about the prayer meeting. One of the things that Pastor uh, told Tim and I a while back that the young adults ministry would be like the front line for the block parties. And I believe like this this block party, we really were with prayer. And um, one of the things that we did um, during the prayer meetings, we prayed the two weeks before, and all it was was just drums. And so George played the drums, and we came up here, and we each had something to pray for. But it was nonstop praying. The se- that second time, um, it just you know, we just kind of narrowed in the focus. And I was I was like using the Blitzkrieg example or like that's some military tactic where you just focus everything onto like one um, specific thing. <laughs> we were really taking it seriously. But I'm going to tell you, we really do have um, some really powerful, um, I don't want to call you young adults. I mean, I guess you are young adults. But, you know, I do want to say that Rock Church, Virginia Beach, their young adult ministry goes up to 35. So um, I think we're going to... Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, let me uh, let me pray that uh, play this really quick, and you can kind of hear just the sound. So imagine that for an hour, and then he had. I mean, George was. Just he had all these different kinds of sounds that he. So imagine that all you hear, you're walking around. I was thinking of um, Jericho, and that's all you hear. You're walking around and you're building your faith, and that's what we did for an hour. And um, do you hear all this difference? And then it would. But I did want to um, share one testimony. Um, you know, Tim got uh, when we found out that he was getting that um, his raise and stuff. We were able to just in the nick of time go and get some things that we wanted to get for the block party. And one of the things that we found, you know, of course Valentine's Day was over, and I went to Walmart, um, and they had all their stuffed animals on sale for like. Um, they, I mean, all different sizes, but they the size I found it was 75 cents, but they were so soft. These stuffed animals, they were probably like this big, but I found uh, they had all different kinds. They were so, it was so amazing. So we've bought 40 of them. And um, at right that, uh, before that Wednesday, we came and packed the groceries, um, the whole family of it, all four of us laid our hands on them. We prayed for each one of them. And um, the Lord spoke to me that um, to give these to Sister Kim so she can give out to them. Because I just heard, I kept hearing joy, joy. And I thought, oh, joy, we really have a joy. And um, I thought, yes. And I said, Tim, you know, I really, instead of giving these out in the children's area, I thought, why don't we give these to Sister Kim? And so we gave it to her. And she said that um, she really wanted to go buy some things, but she didn't have enough time to do that. And just everything happening at you know, with their family and everything, so she didn't have time to go buy some things. So it was just such a blessing. I just felt so good about that, and Tim and I were so excited. But um, that was really something that really touched my heart. But uh, what else? I don't know. I just thought this overall was a great block party. I mean, the, just the the level, you can just see where it was just that level up, and we just had a lot of new things, a lot of great things to give out, especially in the kids' area. We had way more than 50 kids. Um, I know Demarcy led some kids to the Lord, and maybe she, she might want to share that. And um, but and Tim and I got to pray for a lady at the end of the block party who rededicated her life. And then um, we also asked her to re- if she wanted to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was really a first for us too at the block party. So I thought, okay, we're taking it to the next level. We really are taking it to the next level. So that was awesome. So that's it. Um, something, um, not small, but something that stuck with me this year. Um, normally, what we try to do is we, at the clothing booth, we try to have everybody come inside the booth because you see a lot of people that will hang on the outside. And when I was praying, you know, the Lord was showing me that those are those people that want to be safe. They feel safe because they don't have to talk to anybody. They don't have to have that confrontation of somebody yeah, they're not boxed in, that, that type of feeling. So we try to work on that every year as far as having everybody come inside. Make sure you come inside and can we help you find something? Can we get the right size for you? Can we give you some prayer? And there was so much of that going on and it was great. But this year I kind of stepped outside and I stood outside the booth 
not to police the area, if you will, but to just try to encourage people that were standing on the outside, you know, come on inside, come inside. We don't want you to get hurt out here. We don't want something to fall on you. And in doing that, I had a little experience, and it stuck in me. And at the time, this gentleman came over with his bicycle, and he looked a little bit weary and kind of, you know, he needed some clothing that looked like he could use some new clothing and so forth, and he had a, a sandwich with him. And I said, how are you doing today? He said, you know, I'm doing pretty good. And he just starts talking. He just started talking. And the whole time I'm talking with him, the Lord's telling me, just keep in his eyes, keep in his eyes, keep in his eyes. And so I'm just really you know, looking into him. And he was trying to give me a history of why he was there in Oldsmar. And I wasn't quite following it. But again, I was concentrating more on his eyes. And I think this was the Lord protecting me from something that maybe I shouldn't intake into myself that he was giving me. And he talked and he talked and he informed me that he was the Prince of Switzerland. And and I was like, well, that is amazing. That is amazing. And he ended up in, in Oldsmar. And so we talked and we talked and we talked and we talked. And with that, you know, I said, well, why, why don't you step in? There's some stuff here for you if you'd like it. And he says, no, you've already given me what I needed. I just needed somebody to talk to. And that just really touched me. And so the Prince of Switzerland will be with me for a long time. And that's that's what he was looking for, though. That's what he was looking for, which is somebody to talk to him and listen to him. Um, I'm going to go back. Um, I was walking this dog I had. Oh, sorry. Walking the dog, and um, this guy, and this was a, like a little bulldog, you know. And this guy comes running up behind me, and um, the dog bit him in the bull, and it was really kind of terrible for him. And then, then I got all scared, and I, I was afraid the dog was going to bite somebody else. Even the police man came and said he'd shoot the dog if I didn't um, be careful with her. So anyway, I was all upset, and I went home. And um, then I had pastor pray for me, and um, because he said he was going to sue me, right? So pastor prayed for me, and then I felt good again, and I just let it go, and I thought, geez, it's over. Then he wrote me a little... Uh, the, the lawyer, the lawyer wrote me a note and said um, that they weren't going to try to sue me because I didn't have any insurance. So I thought it was all over with. And then just recently he sends me a letter and um, he said he wants me to pay for his medical bills that he had to pay for. Well, my bank account's really down lately, and I have, have hardly any, and I have all kinds of things happening. Uh, money, it's like God is testing me to be, have faith. You know what I'm saying? Terrible. I, I haven't had anything quite like it before, but I do have faith. And so, um, but I told the guy, well, you know, you ran up and scared the dog. And it's half your fault. I'll pay half of it. Well, no, he wouldn't have that. So he sent me a thing, and he said he was going to take me to a small claims court. And he gave me 30 days to pay him. So I said, well, um, I didn't know what to do. I was thinking of just ignoring it some more, you know, and let God take care of it. And I, I got encouraged by other people to just forget it. He was just trying to take advantage of me. Of course he wasn't. He was, you know. But um, so all of a sudden, I hear God saying a scripture. If they're going to, if the man wants to take you to court um, and is going to sue you by the law, Give him your cloak. If he wants your cloak, give him all of you. you give him your coat, too, or something like that. I forget what I, exactly what it says. I hear this. So then I know, oh, God wants me to pay the man. 
So I gave him, I offered him half, and I'll pay, make payments on the rest of it. But you know, I felt so good when I did that. It was so a relief to do that. I knew it was right. And it was like he was saying he was avoiding it all. That's what I was doing. I was avoiding it all. But um, I'm happy to say it was wonderful when I finally submitted to God what I should have known anyway to do. Well, this is my first time doing the children's Bible walk. Yeah. You do? I've slept a lot since then. Hmm. Interesting. Are you sure? Anyway. Anyway. Bill's right. Anyway. He didn't get to hear that very often, so. Um, I was, uh, it was really cool with the kids coming through there to see how hungry they were. And, um, you know, you could tell there were some of the kids that you would, because I was uh, the woman with the alabaster box, and so I was, you know, explain. I was telling them who I was and, Basically, it was the segue of um, God told me to do this in pre- preparation for his burial. And um, and kind of in, in did it in such a way that it was like, did you ask, I asked the kids, did you know he was going to be raised from the dead? I didn't. I didn't know that was going to happen. Did you know that? You know, and it was really cool how engaged the kids were. Now, some of them, they were like, you know, just give me the stuff so I can get, you know, my ticket and my toy. And But there were there were a lot of them who were just like really paying attention. And, and um, there were some that I felt like they were um, maybe rededicating or, you know, didn't really understand what they were doing. But you know what? I gave my life to the Lord when I was about eight years old. And I didn't really understand what I was doing. But I do know, and God confirmed it to me, that that was the moment of my salvation. Because I, re- if uh, several years, about uh, 15 years ago, I really was really struggling with, God, you know, was that really the day that I gave my life to the Lord because I didn't see the fruit of it? Because I had so much baggage and so much healing that needed to be, that needed to take place that when I, after I gave my heart to the Lord, I did a lot of bad things. And so I thought, well, you know, gosh, where's the fruit, you know? And one night, the Lord, it was around the time that I was also reading (laughs) um, Lord of the Rings for the third time, because I just found out that I didn't didn't know J.R.R. Tolkien was a Christian, and there was symbolism in it. I was like, what? I got to read it again. I'm like, I'm reading the books, and I think I'm I'm in the third book. And in there, there's a, in the end of the third book, there is a scene where... The king, who is Aragorn, for those of you who are fans, um, yeah, that's right. Well, Aragorn is the Christ type, one of the Christ type symbolisms in the book. And in the book, it's uh, one of the other princes has been hit by the Nazgul, has been uh, stricken by the Nazgul. And he's, um, I'll wrap this up, I promise. There is a reason for this. There's a segue here. Talk about Lord of the Rings. Hey, what time is it? No. Um, But he's like in a coma, and he's in this really dark dream state, and he's like on on the verge of death. And somebody remembers an old saying, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer, 
And so they bring in Aragorn, and Aragorn goes into his dream and pulls him out, and which is symbolic of how far Christ will go down into our, the pit of our grossness to pull us out. And when he wakes up, it chokes me up every time. You haven't read the books? you got to read the books, man. The movie doesn't do it justice. But he wakes up and he says, My Lord, you called. What does my king command? And I just like, ah, I'm crying. I'm like, God, I want you to come into my dreams. You know. So one night, and honestly, I can't even remember what it was, but I remember waking up from a dream and thinking, oh my gosh, he just did that. And immediately the Holy Spirit started showing me the fruit of my salvation from my childhood. Because I had given my heart to the Lord when I was eight years old. I had a lot of problems when I was a kid. Imagine that. Don't say anything. That was wide open. Um, but I had uh, problems in school. I zoomed to the top of the class. I had problems with other classmates. I was I was the one everybody picked on and spit literally spit on and kicked and made fun of and all that kind of stuff. I got hit with all three names: Demartian, Sewer, Pain in the Neck, and so. I was at this church camp, this summer, you know, church camp the next summer, and all of the girls were um, making this parade, and they said, you get to the front of the parade because you're the prettiest one here. Well, those were like words I would had never thought I would ever hear in my entire life. I mean, God just started showing me all this fruit, and this girl that would pick on me the most, I beat her in every single track meet. And, you know, it was just, so I know that there's all that to say. There are some kids there at the block party that gave their lives to the Lord that maybe they're, because of the, what they're going through in their lives, they may not get there right away, but I was one of those kids. So we just have to keep praying to those seeds and, you know, just keep doing the good work. Don't grow weary. Just keep doing the good work knowing that it's all going to bear fruit. So. Praise the Lord. Lord, we're so glad to be a part of what you're doing. God, you used us. You continue to use us. And not just us doing it out of obligation. We like doing this, God. It's exciting doing what it is that you've called us to do. It's exciting. Look at the, those little faces in the, in the Bible walk and giving them clothes. And even the, 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 the prince of Switzerland comes in half crazy. But, God, you love him too. And we send the word to him too. And, God, he was ministered to exactly what it is that he needed that day. God, each of us has individual needs. And God, you meet our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And you meet our needs because we are seekers of your kingdom and your righteousness absolutely first. We declare it. We say it. And God, we endeavor to live it. And we will in Jesus' name. We send your people out of here in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And being doers of the word. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>